If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. This has been another episode sponsored by Online Horse College. If you haven't had a look at the wide variety of equine-specific accredited courses, then go to onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Hi, it's Glenis here, introducing myself. I recently chatted with Elise Chan from the Course of Horses podcast. We talked a lot about education in the horse industry, where it's headed, how we can all influence the welfare of horses and safety around horses through education. Enjoy. Hi, this is Elise, and my guest is Glennis Cox, an equestrian coach well-known for preparing her students to work in the horse industry through onlinehorsecollege.com. And Glennis is the host of the informative and engaging podcast, Horse Chats, based in Australia. I've had a great time appearing on Glennis' podcast uh, in the past, and it's my great pleasure to talk with her on Because of Horses. So hi, Glennis. How are you? Oh, hi, Elise. How are you? Wonderful to talk to you again. You as well. Thank (laughs) you. So I want to jump right into it. So as an educator, describe for us what it is that you do and how you help equestrians to prepare for careers. Okay. So if you think of educating, and I'm glad you used that term because we get a bit muddled up, you know, between teaching and coaching and instructing and which one's which and and different people have different opinions. But I really think as an educator, it encompasses everything. An educator is to facilitate learning. I can't go, if someone comes to me or enrolls in a course, I can't grab them by the scruff of the neck and put their nose in it and say, you must learn this book. You know, it's them. They need to come in, realize the opportunity, have an open mind and choose to be educated. So someone who comes in, who's going to argue, who's going to make excuses, that means their mind's a little bit close and they can't get educated as easily as people with open minds quite a few different ways of educating people. But I think if people come in with an open mind, they realise what an opportunity they've got and they choose to be educated, then that makes my job a lot easier. And that's such a great way to think about it too. And, you know, the the history of the horse world Mm -hmm. has been such that um, traditionally you learned by doing. And so it's, it's, it's a more current... Um, oh gosh, I guess what, within maybe the last handful of years, 10 years or so, um, where we've got the opportunity to really educate ourselves and to truly learn from this wonderful body of knowledge. And so yes. that, that leads to the question, how does that balance out experience versus qualifications, education versus that hands-on component? What do mm-hmm. you think is more important? I think um, experience and qualifications, you can't have qualifications without the experience. You can have experience without qualifications. But I think as we move into the 21st century, we've got a lot more legislation, a lot more people asking questions. I think the qualifications validate the experience, if you get what I mean. So you can't. And, And if you think of being a lifelong learner, you know, you want to become a better horse person in whatever field you choose. I know that, you know, 99% of inquiries to our college People have already got that horse experience. They've already got the love and the passion of horses and they're looking to validate it with some qualifications. And it's not chicken and egg. Experience comes before qualifications. Someone can't get a qualification if they don't have experience with horses. But if you think that lifelong learner is like a, um, I don't know, like stepping stones, a pathway, you go out, you get some experience, you get a qualification at this level. You go out, you work within the industry, you um, get more experience and then you realise that you know a lot more than you did when you just got qualified and then you go to a higher level. So it's like, say someone becomes qualified as an instructor. If they're qualified as an instructor, that's the minimum level that they need. But then they've got to keep going out and teaching and getting more experience and just improving their own education and that whole you know, I'm at this level. It's I've been at this level for a certain amount of time. Now I want to progress on. And, you know, you've gained the experience, want to progress on to a higher qualification. And I think that's the case with me too. You know, I sort of started off, I was 
in Pony Club and worked through my certificates and actually then went to the UK. I spent some time in the US, got some more experience, got qualification in the UK, came back to Australia. We were sort of doing stuff then, got qualified there and you progressed to higher qualifications. And then I looked outside the horse industry and got, you know, a degree and a master's in education. And, and now I'm going on to look at a PhD in safety in the horse industry and sort of focused around that. So you know, I don't, I don't want to be one of those people who says, yes, yes, get qualified, and then I'm not <laughs> progressing. I want to make sure that I'm progressing as well. So I think, yeah, yeah just keep, keep bringing along the two together, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, you make a really good point, too. It's not one in the absence of the other. It, mm. it, it has to be um, interconnected between the two. And, and then there's that extra step that you're talking about as well, and that is the application of it. So it's great yes. to have the knowledge, it's great to have the experience, but what are you, what are you doing with it? And, mm. and at the end of the day, how can we improve the welfare of the horse through the education, through the experiences that we're talking about? Okay, if I think about the welfare of the horse through education, you know, just equine science has brought us the five freedoms that horses must have. So if you think of the freedom from thirst and hunger, We're educating people on feed, supplements, you know, health and how much a horse drinks. Then the second one is freedom from discomfort. So we educate people in horse requirements for exercise, their living area, you know, any other social requirements or or the pain from injury and disease. It's not just about treating horses. It's also about what causes the pain and the injury and the disease and how it can be prevented. The next one is the freedom to express normal behavior. We just, we want to teach people about what's normal, but how to be safe. You know, it's not safe to go into a group of horses with a carrot for your own horse and expect that your horse is going to get it. You know, that's dangerous. Yeah. yeah. The word feeding frenzy comes to mind. Yes. (laughs) And then just introducing new horses to a group and things that a mare might do to a foal and you think it's a bad mare, but it's not. It's just the mare teaching the foal how to behave. So some of those things are very important. But I think that the freedom from fear and distress there's a subtle and almost unrecognisable way that horses communicate with us. And if you don't understand that, don't understand the, the reading horses, the expression, the body language. To give an example, I went to catch a horse the other day and the horse came to me, didn't come to me like, oh, wow, you know, that's great. Not, not Probably not quite the same, but nothing particularly unusual. But the way the horse was looking at me, you know, and I put the halter on and walked him away and I kept looking and thinking, this <laughs> horse hates me. He's like, he's usually a really friendly, perky horse and he, none of his body language was any different so much. But the black eye, the look that he was giving me, and then I sort of looked around him a bit and realised that on his offside up near the pole, he had a huge lump on his head and a bit of a gash and there'd been a storm the night before and he'd obviously done something in the storm, probably had a whopping headache thinking, don't ride me today, I'm just not in the mood, <laughs> even though the lump on the head and the the gash was recognisable. It was the eye, the look that he was giving me was just, you know, not a friendly look, not his look. It's the subtle types of um, behaviour, you know, for horses being ridden and not happy. It's um, more education, more education to the riders, to the coaches, to the people around saying that horse is not happy. Even though you can force it into an outline and force it to behave, it's still telling you that it's not going to give its best because it's just not happy. And I think those sorts of things through education are going to help the welfare of the horse. Well, and by extension, you're also talking about improving the safety of people as we are around horses, working with them or riding them. I mean, you know, we've we've all heard of the the tragic accidents that mm. uh, have occurred with some of our finest equestrians. Yep. No fault of their own. They were simply handling a horse. Something just out of the norm happened. The horse reacted and the person was harmed and in some cases actually killed. So when we think about improving the safety of people around horses, with horses, Mm -hmm. we can really do that successfully through education, right? Yep, yep. And and I think even though people say, well, that's horses, I think if we can aim for a zero, and we may not ever get it this century, but if we keep saying we want a zero accident rate, zero, you know, and just keep thinking we want it better and better and better. We want to minimise the accident rates more and more and more and keep working towards that. If we teach people about reading horses from the start, so, you know, we were talking before about 
One of the freedoms is the freedom to express normal behaviour. If we can do that and teach people that it is okay for horses to be standing next to each other and put their ears back at each other and poke faces, that's normal behaviour. We just have to make sure that the horses are tied or in tent, you know, far enough apart that they're not going to have a person caught in between. You know, keep thinking about safety rules and who's, you know, having, having, if you've got two people there, two people on the same side of the horse, things like that. But I think right from the start, better supervision for novices, for beginners, by people who are qualified, not just experienced, but have been assessed at a level. So it's great having the experience, you know, I've been with horses all my life, but unless you've got the qualifications to say, you can do it this way, this way, this way, this way, someone who's been with horses all their life may not realise that there's some safety rules that they should be following. And I think if we can start right off with teaching beginners with someone who's got an appropriate level qualification and then even competitive riders, you know, as those competitive riders go up the level, they go to a qualified instructor who's qualified at that level, not just the same instructor all the way through, but someone who's qualified, someone who can say, yes, you can go out on that cross-country course and ride safe. Not just, oh, gee, I'm a bit worried about you going at that cross-country course, you know. <laughs> I think the coaches have got to, or the instructors have got to be able to step forward and say, I don't think it's safe for you to go out on that course with that horse at the moment. Which is interesting because, you know, we so often hear you fall off, you get right back on, and there's there's a kind of suck it up buttercup mentality. Mm, mm. And balancing the two with that educational component, the constant focus on safety, and in many ways overriding this baggage I think that we all carry, which is to overlook fear, to ignore maybe what our own you know, wisdom is telling us, um, even if that wisdom is, you know what, I'm, I'm concerned, I don't feel confident here, instead of just getting on the horse and going off into a situation you're already feeling badly about, taking mm-hmm. a step back. And mm. thinking about that, I, I agree, is so important. Mm. So mm. you talked a little bit ago about you know, your own experiences, your own education. What was your journey like? And is it one that you'd recommend to others? No, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, I think when I started to ride, oh, I just wanted to ride. You know, I wanted to have more of a connection with horses. I wanted to, you know, I don't know that I ever thought that when I first started to ride, I didn't think I was going to be a competitive rider. I just wanted to have a horse, I suppose. And um, my first pony was a pony that had just been broken in. So, you know, very green, you know, no lessons, no nothing, and just sort of got bucked off a few times. And then I think one of the other kids had maybe jump on it for a bit for me and, and then I'd jump on again and maybe get bucked <laughs> off again. So not not at all what I would recommend. You know, I suppose it was just my persistence that I kept going with it. A lot of people possibly would have just stopped by the time they'd been bucked a few times or all got off. But anyway, we ended up working it out, you know, thanks to the other local kids in the group paddock that we had, probably more than anything. And so I thought I could ride, you know, I could sort of walk to a canter, pop over a jump about 50 centimetres high. And then my next horse was a bigger horse and it was the next stock horse. So a stock horse is going to turn and stop and be a lot quicker and sharper and everything. And I think I fell off about five times in the first week just because oh. it was it was just turning quick, too quickly, <laughs> turning too quickly, stopping too quickly, you know, going to canter and just about fall off. And then my next horse was one that had done a bit of show jumping, okay, and it wasn't until I started to do a few workshops with um, Coleman de Bulger, who taught the New Zealand Olympic team, until he came across and did a few workshops and then I sort of started to get a bit more of an idea but before then, I was up to my third horse before I had any lessons. You know, it just wasn't, it's not very good at all and, and certainly not one that I'd recommend. Yeah. 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 So give it an opportunity. So if, if you've got, you know, the perfect play map mm-hmm. in terms of guiding another individual to learn to ride, what would that play map be like? I would say absolutely the best value is under instruction, go to a good riding school, one that's got good quiet horses, one that's got capable instructors. When I say capable instructors, they don't have to be Olympians. They have to be instructors who've been trained in the process of teaching a beginner rider, you know, because it's different skills. And if they can teach a beginner rider under instruction and get someone to 
be able to ride. We used to get a lot of um, Japanese students over and they'd come over. Their visa would go for three months, so they'd book into a 12-week course And I think one of the early ones that came through had no experience with horses whose parents rode, and they said, when you get to this age, you can ride. So she came over for a 12-week course. I don't think she'd even touched a horse. So she came over, did 12 weeks of under instruction, and by the end of the 12 weeks, she could walk, trot, canter, jump, and wet in a small competition. You know, that's the Mm -hmm. ideal to do that. If you're up to that stage where you can walk, trot, canter, jump, you've been under instruction the whole time, you're almost ready for your second horse, you know. So the first horse goes off and it's almost a a delete. You know, you don't look for a first horse anymore. You go to a school, you develop your skills and you get ready for your second horse. If you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look. Horsechats.com. Yeah. And, you know, one of the most important factors, once you've identified a great school to learn to ride Mm -hmm. with a great instructor who is experienced and has the skills that you were talking about and really knows what they're doing, not just an individual who has put out a shingle and said, sure, I know how to ride and I can teach you too as well, right? Mm -hmm. That's not, that is not what we're talking about. No, not at all. But they also have to have appropriate lesson horses. Yes. You know, they're they're not these fiery green Arab stallion kind (laughs) of horses. These are, these are schoolmasters who know their job and can provide the confidence and the setting and the foundation for riders to learn well, appropriately and safely, which kind of leads to the next question. So, so much of what is imperative in being skilled around horses, developing that experience, is the hands-on component. So, how successful are online programs in terms of educating people about horses? I think if we look at online programs and think that they're a complement to the real stuff, you know, you can learn a lot, And we talked earlier about, you know, learning by video and lots of programs. You can learn a lot just through technology. And if you think about the educational methods or the acquisition, you should have acquisition of knowledge, skills, value, beliefs and habits, okay, when you're learning. So if you think that the knowledge, the values and the beliefs can be learnt online, but the skills and the habits have to be learnt with real horses, The good thing about the whole online presence is it's very flexible. It's there, it's online, you can learn, you can be a shift worker, you can come in, you can learn, you can work, you can prepare for workshops, you can do all the theory, you can do a lot of theory that then becomes a lot better um, economically because the theory is there and online and you know exactly what you need to learn rather than an instructor teaching a small group. Um, But then you've still got to prepare for your practical And the practical should be until you're confident, until you're you're doing everything in a satisfactory way, it should be supervised by someone who's got the ability to do that correctly, okay? If someone already knows how to lead a horse even, you know, lead a horse, control a horse, turn a horse, you shouldn't go out there and start practicing leading, controlling, turning with horses that are possibly unsuitable and, um, you know, you're giving the horse the wrong signals. So, Our most successful, even though we're called Online Horse College, and we are actually in the process of changing that to International Horse College, simply because we do have quite a few international students from quite a few different countries, and we're not an online college. We don't just do online. We do a lot of workshops and a lot of practical assessments, and we have assessors, you know, right throughout the world and people who are able to do those assessments for us. So if you think learning versus assessing, you can learn a lot, learn the knowledge, the values and beliefs. You've still got to learn the skills and the habits and the assessments have, especially assessments with horses have to be done with horses. But our most successful and most engaged students are actually the ones that come to the live-in workshops. Now, they don't come to, I think the year-long live-in workshops is a little bit outdated, but we get them to come for one or two weeks, four times a year. So they come, they engage with the other students, they're free from the distractions, they stuck in, they get study, and then they go away to do the school term or to do other things. Then they come back a couple of months later and do another really intensive 
live-in workshop. And I think that's the model that we found works the best is the intensive work and then the, you know, study in your own time type work and then the intensive work again and then the study in your own time type work. So we're, we're using technology, we're using the online programs, but we're backing it up with real-life workshops. And, you know, one thing that came to mind as you were talking was, um, well, first, by having that online component, it provides students with an opportunity to connect with the finest uh, coach, trainer, educator, yep. uh, regardless of where that person physically sits. The, yes. the knowledge is so much more accessible. And a program like the the program that you have now is so available. It's created by an equestrian for equestrians. And someone who has learned mm-hmm through the school of hard knocks, so to speak, as well as learned correctly. So you can see very clearly the difference between what not to do and what to do. I I feel the same way about my own growing up with horses. You know, I was kicked and rolled over with and rubbed against barbed wire fences and (laughs) under tree limbs. Uh, I had a, I had a horse that put a kid in a chest cast. I mean, you know, everything. Right. Yes, and yes, and it yes. was it was an allegedly kid friendly, kid safe horse. And we've all heard horrible, horrible stories about that. But the other thing that, that it makes me think about is given where we are in time, you know, we're well into the 21st century. How has this style of education changed, do you think? from the 20th century, even even over the last 100 years? Mm, mm. I think, you know, even when I was studying, I went to the UK and did a live-in workshop for 12 months. You know, that was what I did to first learn how to become a coach or become an instructor. We've had two colleges in Queensland that are closing at the end of the year because with the research, they're just saying, look, in the 21st century, the live-in, the long-style live-in it just doesn't work. It's a faster pace. I think the students are quicker thinkers. I think they're quite happy to skip classes and then just download the class because they can download the class in, you know, like one and a half speed, still hear it quite clearly, but not go through all the, you know, getting to the class, getting ready, you know, all the the chit chat. They can get through a lot more work. There is a perception that they lack the ability to focus And possibly, but I think that while some may lack the ability to focus, there's also quite a few young people coming on that have got the ability to focus very well and focus on one thing for a long time, but have a variety of things. I think we're fitting a lot more into our life these days. You know, I mean, my life was, yes, I'm going to England. I'm going to be there for at least 12 months and I'll see you when I get back. You know, whereas now it just wouldn't happen like that. It wasn't, you don't just go across the other side of the world and then lose contact with everything. You keep other things going at the same time. So I think it's changed quite a lot. I think, you know, we're using technology to our advantage. We can fit a lot more in. We can get places faster because of the faster pace and the quickness of everything. You know, you've got to spare five minutes. And even though a lot of flack is given to people to check their phone, I often do. If I've got five minutes and I'm standing in a queue, I'll check my phone, but I'll check my emails. I'll answer an email or two. So I'm fitting more into my day. And I just think that's what people are trying to do is to fit more into their day. If you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look. Horsechats.com. And how do you think that education within the horse industry is evolving? What do you think the future holds? You know, thinking about, and again, going back, I mean, the future for me was just become a higher level coach. You know, go along. Okay, well, you're riding at that level, ride at a higher level. You're riding, you're you're doing a couple of three-day events, right? The next thing you need to do is ride an FEI dressage. You know, you ride an FEI dressage. Well, what level show jumping are you? You know, what are you doing? It was all about my career was all competition focused. That was a career. So it was either become a, um, you know, someone who picks up manure all the time and that's pretty much your, your thing or else you just get to become a higher level coach all the time. Whereas I think there's a lot more now. You know, if you think about the horse welfare and the, the five freedoms, there's more understanding of the horse. The horses are used in other areas. There's a movie coming out and I've I've interviewed the writer, director. It's called The Mustang and if you get to see it at least, it's a really good movie. It was set in a Nevada prison where they were catching the Mustangs in and using them in the prison program. So, 
you know, future of education, it's jobs like that to go and work in the prisons with horses. There's um, equine assisted learning, equine assisted therapy. There's a lot more focus and, and thinking about the comfort of the horse and people being able to read horses. There's a lot more body workers have got a lot more. You know, there's futures in racing and breeding, you know, in some of the more traditional coaching But there's all these other things opening up as well. So there's lots of careers in the horse industry. And I know when I was at school, my guidance officer said, oh, the the horse industry, there'll be no jobs there. You know, you're just picking up manure. I think the horse industry is really expanding. And while a lot of jobs are becoming defunct, I think the whole personal training is expanding and the work within the horse industry, I think, is expanding. Yeah, and, and that's something that you and I have talked about uh, before uh, on your podcast, which is that there are so many different ways mm. to pursue a career that incorporates your love of horses. And, you know, growing up, in my own experience, it was exactly as you're describing. You know, it was if you were involved with horses, you were hands-on, you're in the barn. Yep. Um, if you're one of the rarefied few who the, the stars align for and you have the talent and tenacity and you stay healthy and the right horses <laughs> and the finances and, 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 yeah. maybe you'll progress competitively or as a trainer. Otherwise, you'll be hot walking, you'll be grooming, yeah. you'll be washing horses and cleaning stalls. That's, you know, it was one or the other. But um, anymore, there's so many wonderful opportunities to have a very fulfilling career in the horse world that um, can take all of those additional skills that you have, you know, whether it's as a writer or a business person or a marketing person or a photographer or uh, someone who's into shipping or someone who's interested in facilities and architecture and building and and a million different things that we just don't even have time to list. Mm -hmm. But it's figuring out your own interests, unifying them, connecting them with your love of horses, and then exploring the options that might exist near you, but always always being open yep. to what um, to what uh, the the world might bring your way. You know, I was reading your mission, and I really like it, and it's to improve the welfare of horses throughout the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. Mm-hmm. And I was really curious. How are you doing this, whether it's through your podcast or or it's through your your work as an educator? how do you how do you encompass such a wonderful mission? <laughs> I, I think I've got to do it on a few different levels, okay? So I'm a member of a few local clubs, and being on a committee, you can influence a decision at a minute level, you know, just to to individual clubs that are a handful of people. But decisions based on horse welfare and think that hate safety because, If you think of human safety, that's going to help increase horse welfare. If we can keep people safe, then that helps people think more favourably about horses, and I think that's important. So it's the safety and the horse welfare. So if I can influence decisions there based on the horse welfare and safety, and then when I have the opportunity, because we have different forums, different ways to improve educational courses, if I can get on educational committees within the horse industry, any time I can, I get on one of those and they might only run for a year or two and then they've got to review things. But any time I have the opportunity to influence the education within the horse industry, I do. And you're right, podcasts are brilliant, aren't they? They're just so many great guests and you can just learn from them and ask the questions that you need to ask. You would have experienced that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So I love yeah. I love doing the podcasts. And then, of course, we've got Online Horse College that's turning into International Horse College will be, you know, within the next sort of month or two. And I think that itself, you know, it introduces me to be able to influence people again on an individual basis, but a broader basis too, you know, to just improve the welfare of the horse. And, you know, and then I'm coaching as well. I'm teaching. I assess quite a few coaches. So, you know, I'm doing it on on quite a few different levels. I suppose it's just my mission. It's what I get up in the morning and do, you know, what can I do today to influence horse welfare throughout the world? Well, and with all of this wonderful information and so many different ways that people could connect with you, what Mm -hmm. do you recommend for listeners in terms of finding you online? A couple of different ways, probably to email direct glennis, G-L-E-N-Y-S at onlinehorsecollege.com. Or if they go to onlinehorsecollege.com and soon to be internationalhorsecollege.com, 
or horsechats.com, any of those places they'll be able to contact me and phone number, email if they've got any questions, yeah, anything that they'd like to say that they're doing to contribute to the welfare of horses throughout the world would be great as well. Oh, that's wonderful. And that information will also be located in the show notes for this particular episode. So, Glennis, thank you so much for talking with me today. It's been such a pleasure. I've so enjoyed um, talking with you on Horse Chats, and it's uh, terrific to host you on Because of Horses. Thanks, Elise, and looking forward to talking to you on Horse Chats again soon. And thank you for your time. Thank you for, um, for having me on. It's been wonderful talking to you. Now, if you're still there, you probably know that I'm absolutely passionate about education within the horse industry. That's why I host this podcast. My other venture is Online Horse College. Have a look now at onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below. 